All right. So, among all the communities, Jewish communities that were attacked by the Germans during the, during the Holocaust, the Norwegian one is one of the, the smallest, if not the smallest. Less than 2,000 Jews lived in Norway as the German occupied the country in 1940. Uh, in the course of time, about half of them got across the mountains to Sweden, um, and uh, 772 <coughs> were deported on two big transports and two smaller transports to Auschwitz. 38 of those survived. Two of the survivors were physicians. One of them, a Czech refugee who had come to Norway uh, in 1939 after the occupation of his homeland and the other one a native Norwegian physician and those are the two I'm going to talk about um, until recently almost nothing was known into the international uh, community about uh, about the Holocaust in Norway Yad Vashem has published two books by survivors and uh, one of them uh, Julius Paltiu uh, which was out only this month um, and uh, he was a textile merchant a uh, very young guy when he was deported uh, from Trondheim and the other one uh, Robert Sabosnik um, his book is and, and this is one of the uh, medical doctors and the, the one I'm going to talk about and the reason why I can talk about them is that uh, Yad Vashem asked me to do the editing of those two books and, and uh, uh, you might think that Denmark and Norway is more or less the same, it isn't, it's quite diff very different stories, especially during the Holocaust, um, but um, they are also close and we have the privilege that we are able to reach, read each other's languages. So Jewish physicians from Norway as prisoners in Auschwitz. Um, in his book, uh, Robert Savosnik's um, emphasizes that it is impossible to explain or tell about the uh, experience of Auschwitz. This is, it is an indescribable situation. Um, this is a conclusion he's drawing after 80, after the, uh, on page 89 of his book. So he actually tried and somehow reached the conclusion it is not possible for me to, to tell you everything but he told us a lot and this is the reason why we can uh, dive into uh, the life of a, uh, a physician who ends up in, in Auschwitz. Um, these are my two uh, suspects you could say. Leo Eitinger born in Prague and became a very well-known physician in Norway after the war. Uh, Robert Savosny, born in Trondheim, and uh, moved back to his, um, to, to actually always kind of worked in the vicinity of where he grew up, and uh, did not become a very public person until very late, when he, where he joined the Norwegian peace movement. And, um, and, and started to be, be active in, in civil rights issues. Um, here we have a comparison of, of the, the uh, itinerary of those, the two of them. <coughs> Leo Eitinger came from Bohorlice in, uh, in the, uh, the Czech Republic and studied medicine at the University of Brno. Um, then he fled. He was an activist in the socialist movement in Czechoslovakia and um, when the Germans moved in, he first was active in getting a lot of people out of, of, Czechos uh, of, of Czechoslovakia and then eventually was helped to get to Oslo himself and um, from where he uh, gained a position uh, in the north of the country in Budu um, and from there he very quickly, as, the, uh, as you can say, the, the Germans moved in and the German and the Norwegian Nazis moved in on the, on the, uh, on the, the Jews. Uh, he went into hiding in uh, Nischestranda, uh, which is the place uh, with the little boat. Um, and he, he was hiding there for a couple of months with other Jewish uh, refugees uh, working at a sawmill. 
uh, not as a, as a doctor, but as a worker. And at one point, uh, the Gestapo or the Novi and and or the Norwegian police uh, got ho got hold of them and put him into the Ålesund prison, moved him on to Falstad, and um, in Falstad he uh, could have met and has met uh, Robert Zabosnik, um, who um, studied medicine in Oslo the only med faculty of medicine in Norway in those days, and worked in Trondheim, uh, close to home, and was taken to Falstad, which is also close to home. And then if we follow their itinerary, just to give the brief, a brief picture, both are taken to Auschwitz, not on the same transport, um, but they're both, both taken to Auschwitz. They are selected for work at the Monowitz uh, building site, uh, IG Farben building site, and from there they are moved uh, uh, to, to different uh, uh, other concentration camps. Uh, uh, Robert Savosnik and com comes to Warsaw, the, the concentration camp of Warsaw in the former ghetto, um, and from there to Dachau, uh, and uh, Leo Eitinger, uh, gets um, uh, gets a, like a position in um, a, a camp very close to Auschwitz, and after that is taken to Buchenwald, where he joins the camp resistance in Buchenwald. If we see the uh, careers of these two uh, young uh, prisoners. Um, they both start out doing construction work. So it's not that they are selected as because of their medical skills to do anything useful. They're just doing construction work. And uh, in the course of very short time, um, this also makes them sick. So they end up in the Rebia. Uh, I mean, they're not together because Savosnik arrives in November 1942 and Leo Eitinger in February 43. So they uh, only meet briefly at one point during their Auschwitz stay. But so they become Revere patients and uh, Savosnik is uh, sent back after having been cured or has better, his con condition has better, is sent back to construction work. Whereas um, uh, Leo Eitinger is recruited at the Revere, because he's a doctor, he is recruited not actually to do treatments, but to be a Revere Schreiber, which is, the, uh, among other things, the person who makes the death certificates for those prisoners who need death, who, who, who need death certificates. Um, and then, as you can see, uh, Robert Savosnik is going in and out of a profession, a, a, a position which is related to medicine, being a Revier, a Krankenpfleger, and eventually again a Pfleger and a Hilfspfleger, uh, but never working as a, a physician. He was in his um, clinical training phase when he was deported, um, but in between he has to, to go back to, 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 to doing the heart manual worker again and again, whereas Leo, Leo Eitinger sort of gets on the track of being uh, uh, employed by the SS as a Heftling's artist in the course of time in different camps. So this is the book that Robert Savosnik wrote about his, uh, his uh, Auschwitz experience. It was published in uh, Norwegian originally and has been republished after the publish publishing of the Yad Vashem issue and the, and the, and the German version, uh, there's a new version out. Uh, Ernst Zawosnik was the father, uh, he vanished in Auschwitz, and uh, they had a uh, watchmaking and uh, jewelry store in, in Trondheim, but mostly concentrating on, on watches and also gramophones and, and all, uh, that kind of thing. Dika, his mother, um, uh, you have Robert and you have Michael. Michael, who at an early stage joined the Norwegian partisans and left for the mountains, um, whereas uh, Robert uh, chose to stay home, and uh, be ba basically very much because his mother was had uh, was su suffering from a, a, a nervous condition, and he 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 had the feeling he couldn't leave her alone, and he was afraid that that something would happen to her 
if he would also like his brother leave for the resist for, for doing resistance activity. Here you have him uh, with his mother after 45. The brother also survived uh, after a certain time. He had to go to Sweden to flee to Sweden, whereas the mother survived in a mental home in, uh, in Norway. This is a hospital where uh, Robert Zawasnik was doing his clinical training at the time when, when he was arrested. Um, a small hospital outside of, of Trondheim, and he was brought to the Fallstadt uh, Strafgefangenenlager, um, which became uh, a notorious uh, central concentration camp for the central part of, of Norway, very brutal, a very brutal place, um, where Norwegian Nazis and German, uh, German uh, criminal policemen uh, really tortured and, and uh, uh, the, uh, tormented the, the prisoners. The deportation by uh, ship, of course, from Norway, from Oslo. Uh, you have the date and you have a picture, which is actually an, which is an authentic picture of uh, taken on the day of the first deportation, which was the largest one, 529 Jews, and amongst them were uh, Robert Savosnik and his father. His father didn't survive more than four or five weeks in Auschwitz, um, and, and kind of a, a, a man whose best age could not stand the distance in, in a concentration camp, such as conditions were. Um, uh, Eitinger, as I mentioned, was uh, deported later on uh, on a much smaller transport at, uh, on, and, as, and at a different ship. They both ended up in Auschwitz Monowitz and doing, uh, doing construction work, and these are pictures from, uh, from that place. Uh, and I guess these, these pictures are uh, well known, but there's a, speci there's a special, special angle to the one we are seeing with the prisoners on it, because the prisoners worked as aides to civilian workers. And one of the Norwegian prisoners was so lucky, you could say so lucky, that he was able to kind of bond with a Danish civilian worker who had volunteered for work in Germany and ended up at this building site to an electrician. And uh, this electrician helped him get in touch with and get messages back to Norway, I am alive still, and get a parcel, uh, which then again almost cost him his life. That was not Robert Sawasny, um, that was uh, someone else. We have a, we have a, a letter that Robert Sawasny wrote in, in the... Um, in, in Auschwitz uh, Monowitz, and it must have been very early, and these letters were allowed to be sent in order to reassure whoever was, like uh, people who knew them and uh, back in Norway, that everything was fine and there was, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that they were safe. And this is what he writes. And what he writes, what, uh, the most important thing is that he's asking about his mother, and she is at this at that time. She is at this home, which is an, a mental home. And it's definitely uh, the reason why he wants to make sure that she gets to know that he is alive. Uh, he, sh uh, he was very attached to her. Um, he gets sick. He gets very sick. And at one point, he uh, is preparing himself to die. Uh, and uh, as you can see from, 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 this, uh, from this quotation, uh, he is uh, donating his belongings to a a, a Dutch a fellow inmate, and this uh, fellow inmate doesn't want them and say, you will live, and he says, I don't believe it, uh, and he faints, uh, fa faints and, uh, and eventually he kind of, kind of discovers, and, uh, and discovers that he's alive and is very disappointed by this because he had kind of prepared himself that this is the end for me. Uh, but he's actually sent back to, con to construction work, and once he's out there, at one point there is a saying around the Monowitz camp that uh, medical personnel is needed, and he dis describes how he is discussing with himself: Should I go or should I not go? Also with some of his fellow inmates, because going to the revier and volunteering for to do medical work would put him in a position where he would suddenly be seen by the SS. So he had 
he, he, he knew that one way of passing through the camp would be simply not to be seen. Uh, and volunteering is the opposite, of course. On the other hand, the Revere might be a safe place for those who work there, although it was certainly not a safe place for the patients because uh, various patients were killed deliberately by SS doctors uh, in the Revere. So it was a terrible uh, decision to, to make, really. But he decides to volunteer, and he is taken to, taken to the Stammlager, which is somewhere else in Auschwitz, and uh, is, uh, applied, uh, 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 get, get, gets the position of a, of a, uh, an, a medical orderly. Uh, and it's the same prisoner hospital where Leo Eitinger, at a later stage, is also uh, becoming the position of Lagerschrank. But uh, Robert Savosnik is very quickly taken on in '43. Of course, after the uh, ghetto uprising, the Germans uh, left a lot of uh, burned-out buildings and a lot of corpses under the buildings, and uh, Jewish prisoners were taken from Auschwitz to clear up the rubble and make sure that, they, that the building materials could be recycled, and uh, also to remove the corpses. And, um, he again, st then there he again starts with hard physical labor, gets sick, gets to the Revere, and they and 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 eventually ends up in the position where he is uh, again a uh, a Krankenpfleger in the Revier. He volunteers for the typhus ward because that what had made him sick in Auschwitz was typhus. So he thought, I well probably I'm immune. So I won't get sick from it. And so the typhus ward is a pretty safe place in the concentration camp because the Germans like tended to stay away from it in order not to uh, uh, catch the, uh, uh, the illness. Solchen Gefahr, Solchen Revier. At the Revier, he's, um, uh, one of his, uh, his jobs is to take blood samples and he doesn't know what the blood samples are really for because they don't have a, a lab and uh, they don't, but they do send them somewhere and he is, of course, uh, nobody is informing him, but probably these blood samples are being used in uh, uh, research on typhus, which, which was a, a concerted uh, uh, project of the Germans in many concentrations. So in this sense, he is kind of involved in medical experimentation as an aid for SS doctors that he never saw. And he is not, uh, he is not harming anybody just by taking the blood samples, we can, we can say. He describes the situation of, the, uh, of these prisoners. Uh, and uh, since, well, he doesn't feel very menaced by the situation, actually. Uh, the fellow, the, his fellow prisoners, of course, were menaced by death, and uh, here he mentioned some of the complications because the illness in itself was rather dangerous, but also complications, as the, the ones that are mentioned here, uh, were, were dangerous, and there was no medication. Uh, so what uh, you could do as a physician and what you could do as a medical orderly was basically just, you could say, reduced to basic care. Just to, to be with the patient, to, as he mentioned, like make sure that they get something to drink and they get, uh, that they eat their food um, and help them when they need to go to the toilet. Uh, uh, and he describes this humanistic uh, approach that uh, is uh, something that goes through all of his, his description, his, his empathy with his fellow inmates, where he's, where he's describing the situation of somebody who has to die in this sick ward, you know, without having anybody of uh, family or anybody he, he knows around him. Uh, this is tormenting the Krankenpfleger to see the agony of his patients. In, um, in this 
revere in Warsaw. The Warsaw, Warsaw was a horrible concentration camp. I don't know who mentioned earlier on a, one of the commandants from the Warsaw, from the Warsaw concentration camp. Now, anyway, um, this, it was really a, a horrible, a horrible place. Um, and here, uh, uh, Robert Zawosnik also describes the ethical challenge that faces him as somebody who's involved in taking care of them. It's the selection dilemma or the triage dilemma um, that he had to, in, in this specific situation where it's about patients who are coming in with diarrhea, uh, that he, without the proper training, had to kind of find out who, whom shall we give a chance for treatment. But treatment would just be like laying down resting and being fed. Um, so who, who should have the chance and who is too sick so that it wouldn't matter. So this is, this is a very delicate situation and he, he is constantly in doubt of himself. himself. Uh, am I right, making the right decisions? Am I taking life away from somebody who might have recovered, although he looked very bad, uh, and giving life to somebody else? Uh, who would have survived anyway? So of course, this is uh, these are. I think these are, are problems that a at this time, as you as you know, it's just like very young uh, doctor had to struggle with. Um, he's also commenting on the emotions and the, the the effect emotional effect of concentration camp, uh, the concentration camp. I never shed a tear in Auschwitz. He said. Uh, it was as, as, as if a curtain had been drawn over my emotions. He's describing the emotional numbing of the situation, which of course is a coping mechanism and, and a very useful one. Uh, and then the very quick recovery. Right after the uh, liberation, he discovers that he, he, he himself and the other fellow prisoners are suddenly able to show emotions are suddenly able to live out emotions and practice them and hug each other and, and laugh and also cry uh, about what they had uh, felt. What he dis does not describe is the fact that in the course of time um, the camp had changed his constituency. Uh, uh, you can say uh, made a basic change in his constituency. So he has, be he's, he has become incontinent and was, was incontinent in the, for the rest of his life. He could, I mean, it, everything can move him, him to tear. Everything, roman, a romantic episode, uh, the most banal thing can move him to tears. And this, of course, is a long time effect, lasting effect of the camp. Uh, very different from the immediate <coughs> feeling of relief of the situation. Of liberation. We've got a few more minutes. Yes, okay, I'll, 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 I'll speed up. Um, prisoners were mostly alone, and then he has uh, a few prisoners with whom he had made friends, and they are helping each other to survive. Uh, and this is how they survived physically, but as he says, that most of the prisoners would lose psychological capacities for forever in the now we are moving on to Leo Eitinger, who has a, a long, long list of publications and became a very famous, like the founder of psychiatry in Norway and the founder of so-called crisis psychiatry and the founder of uh, military psycho psychology in Norway. And this is the, one, the only um, uh, document we have. It's his death cert certificate. And you would say, oh, come on, come on. How can, how can you have a brilliant career if he's dead? But uh, he faked his own death in uh, Dachau. Um, and uh, since it was his job as Lagerschreiber, to, as, as Revierschreiber, to, 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 to write these pa papers, once the uh, resistance told him that, uh, the Jews are going to be singled out for, for annihilation. He arranged to take the identity of a non-Jewish Czech prisoner who was about the same age um, and wrote his own, uh, <laughs> his, his own death certificate. Uh, he's describing Auschwitz as, as, a, as, a, as a, the work he did as a, as a, a, a prisoner physician, as serious medical work. Um, 
And he is describing the Revere as a place where humanitarian spirit was uh, uh, was dominant. Although, I mean, they worked under they worked as aides of the SS doctors, but still it was possible to do good. It was possible, as he writes it, to perform useful medical work. And you see uh, the international socialist uh, in him that he is stressing the multinational uh, character of the community of uh, prisoner doctors that are part of it. Uh, uh, here he's talking about the uh, the uh, discussions he had with other prisoner doctors. Are we playing the SS doctors game? How far can we go? Um, we know that we can only let somebody live and uh, the rest of them we can't help them. Um, the most difficult part were the selections. Again, the same observations as we had with uh, Savosnik. Values this is, an, uh, this is, this is a, an observation that the early writing has made after the war in investigating very many uh, sur uh, survivor uh, autobiographies and so on and so forth. Um, it seems that those who had a, a useful purpose in the camp, like doctors and nurses, had less neurotic disturbances after the war. But when we re read their memoirs, we also see that they certainly did have disturbances and did have issues that they couldn't uh, cope with. Um, this is the call for me to stop. I will stop <laughs> very, very shortly. But but we need we need to uh, yeah just to just to mention mention this uh, this observation. Uh, he's describing the, the prisoner physician as somebody who is trying to do normal medical work in spite of the condition and that the denial of the actual condition it what is what makes it possible for them to sort of so he, they're creating kind of a make-believe world of normal medicine and that is their tool of surviving uh, which is, I think, a very interesting observation. Um, we worked as if our medical activity was a normal one, and that helped us through. Uh, in the end, uh, the biographer of uh, Leo Eitinger has concluded there were two different ways of coping in the long run with this prisoner experience. The one was to be to keep quiet, keep it to yourself, uh, try to do like but go get, get back to normal. And the other one was to warn and to try to work on that specific experience and make it fruitful for future generations. We could say that uh, Robert Savosnik is, is the one who's cho choosing the first option he, for many years, he didn't speak about his experiences. He tried to, to hide the number on his arm uh, and only, per, uh, only display it. it uh, in Norway, it's easy because it's, uh, there are only very few months where you, where you will walk around with, <laughs> with rolled up sleeves. Uh, but, uh, and he, but he became a pediatrician. And he became a pediatrician because he wanted to do good to the weakest patients, the children. Um, and, uh, and, and as I mentioned, in the course of time and when he, when he retired, he also became an ardent peace activist and very brave, a, a very brave, brave person, courageous person who, who confronted neo-Nazis and even took them to court for spreading uh, Holocaust denials and things like that. And uh, at, at one point, you could say, took contact to specific neo-Nazis in order to convince them to have a dialogue with them. This is a very Norwegian thing, really. And uh, you remember Norway's role in the Palestinian-Israeli uh, dialogue. I mean, he, is, he, he was part of the, you could say, the hinterland of that idea of, of uh, solving uh, problems. The Warner, the one who warned was Eitinger, who became a psychiatrist and who thought that I will do good through my research. 
I will do good, try to understand the long-term effects. And the long-term effects in the beginning were not very visible. I can, of course, because it takes some time. In the beginning, a Danish team of non-Jewish prison adopters described what we, what we came to understand as the KZ syndrome. Um, and they had very much, much focus on, uh, you can say, the physiological aspects. But eventually, uh, most of the survivors came to live a quite normal life and re-entered their careers. And, and, then, and then it turned out that they had problems and, and, and that the long-term effects would, would like make sure that they died early, that they had much more, much more morbidity. And uh, this was what became uh, what became or what I think uh, uh, what Leo Eitinger's uh, research topic and one of the books he wrote on it is, is uh, this one uh, uh, War Damages and uh, Late uh, late Consequences where he is taking concentration camp inmates soldiers and so on and so forth and this is about the end I see you are coming <laughs> to with a critical, with a critical thank you <laughs>